keep me muted. There we go. Good morning, community. How are you today? Um, I am a firm believer. I think it's in scripture somewhere where God gives extra credit for coming to church after spring break. So um, well done. Um, if you'll stand, we'll get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just invite you into this place. We invite you into our hearts and minds, and we just uh, we pray that you feel honored in worship. Um, God, you're the reason for it all, and we just want to um, praise you in this time. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. was redeemed only
shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one is overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the risen one is Amen. You can be seated. We have a very important week coming up, if you're a believer. This may be the, uh, there's no maybe about it. This is the most important holiday that we celebrate Amen. is the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And it's really going to kick off for us today with Palm Sunday. But coming up this Friday, there is a very special event going on. And there's information up here on the screens behind me about it. The Family Easter Journey. Now, this is the second time that we've done this in the last three years or so. This thing called COVID kind of got in the way. Uh, you may have heard of it. Um, this is about an hour and a half, so it's about 90 minutes. We're going to do walkthroughs of different phases of history, of the crucifixion, of the resurrection. And if you have little ones, this is an awesome opportunity to bring them out. There's fun activities at every station. And I'll tell you what, probably the most important thing for our family when we did this three years ago was the conversations that we got to have after it was over. It really helps with your children with a mind's eye, understanding a little bit more about God's love, salvation, sacrifice. You can go through all these different uh, venues and different activities that will really drive it back to Christ. 
So if you have little ones, we really encourage you, make sure you sign up on the church website, edwardsburg.church. Uh, again, it starts about 5.30 or so, but there are different time slots available. So if you work late that day, you should be able to accommodate that as well. So again, please join us this Friday for the Family Easter Journey. Thanks, Chris. Uh, just a couple more announcements. With our celebrating this week with Easter, we actually have Easter next Sunday. And that is, as Chris said, the most important holiday we have. And we would love for you to join us for breakfast starting at 930 and then a service right after that at our regular 1030 time. We would also love for you to invite anyone and everyone that you could to come and join us for that breakfast and for that service. So your neighbors, your coworkers, things like that. Invite them. This is going to be a great opportunity for them to come and hear what we're all about and why we believe what we believe on Easter Sunday. Uh, just to conclude with a couple more announcements, starting next week, we have small groups that is coming up. And with our small groups, if you're not a part of one of those, it's an opportunity where we get together in smaller settings in people's <coughs> houses or some of the groups meet here at the church. And we discuss the sermon and we grow together. If this is something you're interested in, please come see me. I will love to explain to you more about it and get you signed up with one when there are different nights of the week. So one that works for you. And then finally, our SOS youth people, we are going to this. This is an opportunity we have to serve the community and church body. You can help us out by providing bagged, individual bagged chips for this. Uh, they have asked us part of why it's so cheap for the kids to go is that the food is donated. So if you guys would not mind providing some of the chips for that. Let me pray, and we will get back to worshiping. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here celebrating Palm Sunday and celebrating what you have done for us as we go throughout this next week. I pray that uh, our hearts are prepared through this worship to hear the words that Dan has to say to us today. And I pray this in your name. Amen.
Father, I would ask <laughs> that you'd help us to understand better some of these things we just sang, just the whole idea of our life being found in your death. Lord, would you teach us that today? Would you help us to embrace that truth? And Father, when we talk about fears and lies and everything, God, would you replace those with your truth today? Would you just take this time and do a work in our minds and hearts, I pray in your name, amen. You may be seated. Now, if I were to t give you a quick quiz at the beginning here and ask you, uh, now this first question should be easy, so, uh, but if I were to ask you who the main character of the New Testament is, hopefully you would say, thank you. Uh, now, if I were to ask you, however, who is the main character of the Old Testament, actually what you'd want to say is the same answer. Because when you understand all of Scripture is all about Jesus and focusing on him, that is very important. Now, though all of Scripture does point to Jesus, there are four books in the Bible, you may be familiar, that actually talk about his life here on earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we call the four Gospels. Three of those Gospels have many of the same stories and the same pictures of Christ, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John gives a little bit of a different look, but all four of them stress very much the week that we call the Holy Week, uh, the week that we're going to go on today, we're going to take a little bit of an Easter journey going through that. Uh, in fact, if you take uh, all four of the Gospels, there are 89 chapters in all four of the Gospels, four of which uh, talk about the uh, birth of Christ, only four of the 89. So you've got 85 left. Out of those 85, 29 of those chapters deal with this last week, what we call the Holy Week. Okay, in fact, the book of John starts in chapter 12 uh, on that last week. There's only 21 chapters, so it's about half. But if you take all of the Gospels, about a third of them are given to this week. So we're going to go on a little bit of an Easter journey today, if you will. So I thought I would shamelessly put in another plug for Friday night. Easter journey. Uh, there you go. Do notice that it says register by April 10th. I believe that's today, and that is very important because Marissa has a lot of things to buy and get ready for. So if you could sign your family up for that, that would be a great thing. Just so it's clear, he said an hour and a half. They start 5.30 to 6.30. You would be finishing somewhere between 7 and 8. Does that make sense? You go on a different station like that. Oh, also... Since I'm back on announcements for a second here, my wife nudged me and said, we should say something about the ladies' Bible study, which started again this past Thursday, and then the evening one begins this tomorrow night. Uh, so uh, mention those if you are interested. You can check out the website for that, too. Okay, done with the commercials. You ready? Uh, what we're going to do then is we are going to take a little bit of a journey, if you will, a little Bethlehem, uh, Jerusalem trip, and we're going to talk about that trip up to Jerusalem to begin with. Now, when, the, uh, when I say that phrase up to Jerusalem, it is somewhat geographical because Jerusalem sits up on hills. Now, I have not been to the Holy Land unless you count Pittsburgh for a football game. I, I kind of considered that, but uh, most people don't think of that. I have to back me up. Somebody who's been to Jerusalem, it, it does sit up on hills, right? Okay, I, I knew the Hartzels have been over there. Some of you have been to the Holy Land. Uh, so Jer Jerusalem is up. In fact, the Psalms, many of them that are written that they would sing when they went to Jerusalem were called Psalms of Ascent because they were going up to Jerusalem. So the first part of our sermon is kind of an upward journey. We'll talk about going up to Jerusalem. And we are going to read from the book of Mar Matthew. I'm sorry, I should have told you that sooner. We are going to read from uh, the book of Matthew, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 21. Chapter 21. By the way, kind of interesting little fun fact here about Palm Sunday before we start. Uh, Palm Sunday was on the 10th day of Nisan, uh, which is spelled a little bit differently than the car. But uh, in the Jewish calendar, it was the day when they chose a lamb. I just thought that was kind of neat. Jesus comes in, the Lamb of God, on the day in which they chose a lamb. I just like that. It made me happy. Okay, now, uh, let's go ahead and read a little bit from, what did I say, chapter 21 of Matthew? Well, I was right, chapter 21. Okay, verse number 1. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. 
If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Uh, they took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them, and most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. I'm guessing palms. I don't know why I, I thought that. Uh, but uh, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, which is save us now, Lord, save us now. The son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? The whole city stirred up. And the crowd says, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, there's a few things just in this little trip that I want you to think about today. The first of them is, I want you to think about a significant equine. Easy for me to say. Uh, try that three times fast. I, I, don't, I don't think you'll make it. But I did want you to think a little bit. There, there's a lot of, you could make a whole sermon about donkeys. You really could. There's a lot of cool illustrations in them. Uh, but I, I really want it, if you are the type that you are kind of, you come to church and you think there's one thing I want to take away because you're not a great listener. And I'm not making fun of you saying that because I'm not a great listener. Uh, if you're going to grab one thing, I want you to have a picture in your mind. So I have a couple pictures to put in your mind here. Okay. This is, uh, let's see, this is Caden. That's me in the front. Uh, I realize in showing you pictures of me with donkeys, I'm setting myself up for all types of jokes. Uh, you know, hey, there's Caden, and he, he's with a donkey. Um, and if you go to King James, you won't say donkey. But, uh, but anyway, uh, what do we got? We got Caden. Wait, wait a minute. Kingston is behind me, right? Okay, and Caden Hendrix. I thought the big one was Hendrix. Okay. Uh, but, but anyway, there, there, there we are with our donkeys, and there's a picture of <laughs> that is Kingston. So you could say there's Kingston and a donkey uh, if, if, if you want to say it like that. But I, I just thought it would be a little weird. Like I said, there's so many cool things about donkeys. All these donkeys are what they call Jesus donkeys. They have a cross on their back. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Kind of neat. Uh, the whole idea of him coming on a donkey, though, is, is one that I want to stick in your mind uh, here a little bit. Um, oh, by the way, here, here's another little fun fact. I was double-checking this uh, t uh, today. Not that I didn't believe you, Dave, but uh, he was telling me how these donkeys are the, these incredible herding, that's not the right word, protecting animals. They have that instinct. And uh, so I was double-checking you a little bit. Apparently, th I mean, they're, they're considered to be the most protective animal. Uh, they'll beat the snot out of a coyote or even a mountain lion in protecting the herd. What's that? Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, but but anyway, that, you know, th there's got to be a sermon in there somewhere. That whole idea that Jesus came on a donkey and a protector and er everything like that. There definitely is the idea, and we quote it from Scripture that the donkeys are. Uh, was the prediction, fulfilled prophecy that Jesus would come on a donkey. There's great si significance to that, that this would all happen because this is the prediction. But also, and maybe this is the one thing I really want you to take away as you think of the donkey, okay? I want you to remember that in these days, when a king came on a donkey, he was coming in peace. But if a king came on a horse, he was coming for war. And he was coming. And the Bible, uh, I think, makes very clear that when Jesus returns, he is going to come on a horse. He's going to come in judgment. So the message that we need to get is we need to re receive his first coming as he comes as the Prince of Peace and makes a way for man to know peace with God only through Jesus Christ. Okay, so I want you to get the significance of the donkey to start off with. No more goofy pictures for you, but I do have a second idea I want you to look at. Jesus at this time, for this crowd that flocked to him was a refreshing change, okay? Religion had become incredibly stale, and it had become cold, if you want to say it like that. And for them to have this life and this excitement was so new. I don't know what you think when you think of cold, stale. I think I've told this story before, but um, did you ever get, and, and I know this isn't good for you, but every once in a while, do you ever have just a, a hankering for McDonald's fries? Did you, oh, yeah. Uh, but did you ever get them and they've been there a while? 
<laughs> There's nothing nastier. Uh, and I've, I've told this story before. I'm still mad at Dennis Hartzell over this. Uh, Dennis Hartzell was talking about, you know, you can always, in the knowledge, you can always ask for hot, warm fries. You can always do that. And my wife was like, well, I'm doing that. So we had got off a plane coming from Denver, tired as could be, coming home from Chicago, stopped at a stinking toll, uh, not toll thing, you know, a rest area thing, one of these oases. And Frances decides she wants hot fries. Okay, 10 o'clock at night in a rest area McDonald's. She says, can I have some hot ones? Uh, we waited. I was just trying to get home. And we waited for 15 minutes for the stinking hot fries. And she was like, oh, these are so much better. It's <laughs> like, I don't care. I'd eaten cardboard. I wanted to get home. I'm still mad at Dennis for telling her that, that she wanted the hot fries. But, but basically, the cold and stale religion that they were used to, uh, they, they saw something totally different in Jesus. Instead of being a religion that was all about the outward, Jesus talked about the inward. Instead of being a religion of the things you cannot do, Jesus talked about the things you can do. Instead of being a religion that put up barriers, Jesus talked about tearing down barriers. Instead of a religion where you are to work your way to God, he, Jesus said, I am the way to God. Instead of a religion where, that was all about human achievement, Jesus offered something that was about divine accomplishment. Okay, it wasn't about me working my way to heaven. It was about the work that he had done and my faith and trust in him. And people flocked to this. They said, this is awesome. This is alive. We like this. And that's what's happening here on what we call Palm Sunday. The other thing that I'd like you to notice about this trip up, though, is that Jesus had become at this point. You see, all the crowd is jumping in. He had become a bit of a cultural phenomenon. Okay, hey, this is. Kind of like everybody's doing this. Hosanna! Hey, I'm in. Hosanna! In fact, that laying down of the coats, you know, I, when I read about that, it was kind of interesting. They said uh, for a lot of them, the coats then would become like a trophy because they'd say, hey, wait a minute, see this footprint right here? This is a donkey Jesus was riding on. And it's kind of like having a celebrity and you have a, uh, you know, sign my T-shirt. Uh, okay, no, step on my coat. Uh, they didn't have pen pens with you. So it's a, it's, it's a crowd that is driven by just the excitement and I think it is wise for us to stop for a minute and just remember that if our faith is driven by celebrity or if our faith is driven by uh, just uh, events, okay, if we have an event-driven faith or we have a celebrity-driven faith, we're not in a good place because that's going to lead to instability, okay? And, and stay with me here for a second. I, I remember I ran into a kid that I used to teach a while back. And I just said to him, hey, where, where are you going to church? And he said, oh, my church is so awesome. And these are his words, not mine. The pastor is so cool. I didn't want you to think I was saying that. I, they, but he said, the pastor is so cool. He said, the pastor rode into the service on a Harley. I mean, he rode in to preach on a Harley. He said it was so cool. Now, I am not, uh, honestly, I am not mocking that. In fact, someday I might do that. I might come right up this out. Okay, you're not believing that? How about a moped? You go over a hub around? Uh, maybe, maybe we can get a yeah, hub around. That day's coming. Uh, but uh, but anyway, anyway, I don't really plan on that. And I'm not really mocking folks who do things to make church, you know, try to, you know, know what I'm saying. It's not my business to criticize what other people are doing in the name of the gospel. But it is my business to say, be careful. Okay. Honestly, the day is going to come, I realize, where most of you are going to go to a church and I'm not going to be your pastor, whether it is because you're here at community and I'm gone, uh, or whether it is because you move on to a different church or you move on to a different town and you find a different church, you're going to have a different pastor. So I feel in shepherding, again, my job is not to attack what other people are doing, but my job is to caution you. And I do want you to always be leery of event-driven faith and celebrity driven faith okay because we are drawn to that okay we're drawn to that I, I, this whose church you know what church you go to i go to so-and-so's church and it's all a lot of times it's all about that person uh it's all about that so we need to be careful of that because that is the the crowd of palm sunday now i want you to uh think with me here for a second okay what what in the world happened okay on sunday of our week the crowd is hosanna praise him right uh, Hosanna, save us now, King. Here's my coat down you know, for you. Uh, here's the palm branches down for you. We worship you. What in the world happened to get to the place where later on in the week they're not yelling Hosanna? What are they yelling? Crucify him. 
And I think scripture, if we, if we kind of piece together some things, we can go through and we can see some specific things that happened that brought them down. So we're going to talk about the second part of our journey saying it is we're going down to unbelief. I wanted to show you uh, in Matthew 26 now, verse number 61, they said of Jesus, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. This is, this is about the time they're going to crucify him. Here's an accusation. This man said, I'm going to destroy the temple, and in three days I can rebuild it. So this is how they attack Jesus. But I want to show you a different verse back in John chapter 2, verse number 19, and see that this is actually what Jesus said. Jesus said, destroy the temple if you just destroy it. I will raise it up in three days. He wasn't talking about the temple of Jerusalem that he was going to rebuild brick, brick by brick. He was talking about his body. He didn't say rebuild. He said raise. And he didn't say, I'm going to destroy it. He said, you destroy it like that. Now, sadly, <laughs> in this, we, uh, we do learn what makes for a good lie. And that is getting, as close, as, uh, getting close to the truth and just kind of twisting it a little bit. And this is what happened back in the Garden of Eden. Okay, from the very beginning, did God really say, if you study that picture, the, the, the serpent comes and he tempts, he says, did God really say, if you study the response to that question, the answer is no, God didn't really say that. He twisted what God said. And that's what happens over and over again. And I think the first thing it would do us well to look at to, if we're realizing that our faith is sliding, it's heading in the wrong direction, we're going downhill, is to realize that one of the things that will bring us in that direction is if we are believing lies. We're believing a distorted truth. That song that we sang about fear is a liar was so good because it brought some of those lies to bear that we believe. Okay, And when we get those, that wrong thinking in our, in our head and how often we need to have some anchors of truth, we need to have the verses that we believe, we need to be striving to be daily in the Word of God reading and weekly in the Word of God hearing because we need the truth in our life because the lies are going to come to us. So a friend of mine sent me this week, a, uh, sorry, I'm a little slow on my phone here, but uh, he sent me a little thing that I thought, hey, I, I need that. And uh, this is one of, the, I have some things I call my anchor truths that I write in the, in the front of my journal. And uh, he sent me this one. He said, my main job, listen to this, my main job is to live with a deep con contentment, joy, and confidence in my everyday experience and life with God. Everything else is job two. He said, my main job is to live trusting God, glorifying Him because I trust Him, because I walk with Him, enjoying Him, rejoicing in that. That goes back to the old catechism, you know, or the, the purpose of man, to enjoy God and glorify Him. Okay, or I got that reversed, but, uh, but it, it's, it's that idea. And this truth, you know, becomes an anchor that I, I have to run to. And I have some of these written in the front of my journal that are like, hey, every once in a while I need to go back and reread these truths. Why? Because we are bombarded with lies. We're bombarded with lies about ourselves, about God, about life in general all the time. And one of the reasons and one of the ways that Satan is going to shake our faith is with distorted truth. The second thing. That I want to, uh, you know, move. Oh, by the way, <laughs> remember too what they said in that last verse we read earlier, what they said about Jesus. He's a prophet. It's a great example, again, of distorted truth. He really was not a prophet, just a prophet. But that's, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the things they still say today about Jesus. Oh, he was a prophet. He was a good man. He was a great teacher. Okay, great. But Jesus said very clearly, I'm the son of God. Okay? And if we can twist it around to those other things, we can lead people down the wrong road. Later on, it says, now the chief priests, chapter 27, still in Matthew, and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. <laughs> the governor again said to them, which of these two do you want to release? And they said, Barabbas. A lot of you are familiar with this story, but let me point out a second thing that the enemy uses to take us down to the path of, this, of unbelief. He uses powerful voices, the chief priests and the elders. So I encourage you just, again, when we talk about the whole idea of we have a celebrity culture, we go after celebrities. I don't know if you remember one time I, I, get, I looked up the top ten uh, people who have followers on Twitter, 
you know, it's all these people who have nothing, I'm sorry, but they have nothing to do with God. They're either great athletes or they're great musicians. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they're in their teens and people are following like crazy and listening to them. So I want to encourage you, if you struggle or when you are struggling with your faith, when you're struggling just with your thinking, when it's messed up, ask, your, ask yourself, to what people, what voices am I listening to? In fact, I would encourage you to say, you know, right now, T take a minute and think, identify three. Identify three voices that you're listening right, right now. Now, I told you a while back I was finding myself angry a lot. <laughs> and I'm just angry about this and angry about that. And I thought, well, who are you listening to? Sure enough, I was listening to people that were angry all the time. You know, through podcasts and radio and everything like that. I spend my whole day listening to people that are angry. Guess what I was? I said, ang angry too. But if you're struggling with your faith as far as thinking, I really encourage you to ask yourself that question, what are those powerful voices that you're listening to? And then, of course, what did they cry out? They cried out for Barabbas. The third thing that leads us down this path is just flat-out foolish choices. I've seen, I, I don't remember if it was in the Passion of the Christ movie or, or some other depiction of the life of Christ, but I remember seeing a scene where Barabbas is told he's free. <laughs> he's like, no. <laughs> I'm free, really? That's awesome. You know, so this criminal is going free. And the, the stupidity of this choi choice is mind-boggling. You want Jesus free? Remember in that, in that story, uh, Pilate's trying to get out of this. He doesn't want to crucify Jesus. So he comes up with this plan. Hey, who do you want free? And they pick Barabbas. I mean, how dumb of a choice is this? You know, we're, we're going to release this, this criminal. It, it is, again, almost mind-boggling uh, that we're going to go this way. But I want you to think for a moment about why we make foolish choices. Usually it is because there is something that I want to do that I know I shouldn't, or, uh, or maybe it's because there's something that I know I should do that I don't want to do, and I figure out a way to do that. But if you see yourself making those foolish, foolish choices, now let me back up for a second and put all three of those up here for a minute. I don't want to suggest to you that this is a quick fix-all. Hey, get this, and I've solved all your problems. However, this has been an incredible tool for me that I want to share with you. When my thinking is in the dumps, okay, when I am uh, discouraged, when I am depressed, or even when my faith is shaky, it is a very good exercise for me to ask these three questions. First of all, what lies am I believing? And maybe you need some help. Maybe you need a lie detector. Maybe I, I can help with that or, or a Christian counselor can help with that to say, hey, what do you believe in? You know, th just listening to you talk, here's what you're believing that isn't true. Here's what you're believing. You know, may maybe it's something as simple as nobody loves me, everybody hates me. Uh, I think I'll eat some worms, you know. But uh, wh whatever, you, you, wh whatever it is, the first question you ask yourself is, to whom am I listening? The second question I'm sorry, the first question is, what lies am I believing? The second question is, to whom am I listening? You know, who are the voices that, are, that have my ear right now, that have my heart? And is this a good thing? And the third question, uh, that, and th this is a hard hitter. I wrote it down, so I said it the right way here. But what is it that you want to do that is in conflict with the way of Jesus? Let me say that again. What is it that you want to do that is in conflict with with the way of Jesus. And if I play through those, if I, if I look at that and say, hey, maybe with that, I can find why my thinking is so scrambled, why I'm moving away from the truth. Now, we've got to take you a step further here uh, today. We are going to, in a few minutes, I've got a few things I want to talk about first, but we're going to stop and we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. Because if, as we're going through that Holy Week, uh, of course, we start with Palm Sunday, but the different events are going to lead, lead us to Good Friday. And when we think ab about that, we think about, of course, the death of, of Jesus Christ, um, God's Son laying down His life for us. But I actually want to take you for a minute and jump beyond. Okay, we have Palm Sunday, we have a crowd that is celebrating. Good Friday, we have a crowd that is yelling, crucify Him. I want to take you to another day in Jerusalem that just comes a short time after that. We call it the Day of Pentecost. But it is the time when Peter stands up and preaches. And the Bible says that 3,000 people were converted. They were profoundly converted. Uh, and uh, their life was changed to the place where they are, you know, they are baptized, they are joined in the church, they are plugged in. In the book of Acts chapter 
uh, 2, verse number 36, where Peter uh, is wrapping up his sermon. Listen to these words. He says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. I, I always love that phrase. Let everybody know for certain. Okay, this isn't, hey, we hope this is true. This is the God who cannot lie. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both, listen to these two words, Lord and Christ. And Jesus, this is the Jesus whom you crucified. God has made him Lord and Christ. Christ is the word there for Savior, Messiah. And through him we are cleaned. Lord brings us to a place of commitment. Where we say, yes, indeed, your way, whatever it is that you say. And that's what happened here. 3,000 people at Pentecost, at least, were converted uh, and began profoundly converted. So they went from being confused. Uh, they went from being, you know, maybe a crowd that was uh, uh, caught up in the culture of the time and the, uh, a very shallow faith that they had on Palm Sunday. They went from being that, that, that the description of the crowd to a crowd that was yelling, crucify Jesus in hatred, to a place where now they are believing. Where now they are believing. I had a pastor, you know, talking about you know, churches that sometimes get a little bit caught up in the whole idea of events. And, and please, again, this is not a specific target of, a, of anything. But if you get too caught up in events, I had a pastor who used to call that shock and awe. He used to say, hey, shock and awe, that's what we get people in with church. You know, we got to wow them. Every, every week we got to have something that really wows them. But it is very important that we replace shock and awe with repent and believe. Okay, that is the message uh, that we want to go to. And, the, and that first Palm Sunday, they laid their coats down and worshiped Jesus. What we are called to do, you know, not laid our coats down, lay ourselves down in worshiping Jesus. Now, as I said, we're, we're taking a little journey this week. And the journey ends for fr Friday night. Uh, be, and I, I mentioned this before, but because of we're doing the family Easter journey, we're not doing the specific Good Friday service. So we wanted to, to observe the Lord's Supper today. But remember this. This is not only the culmination of Holy Week. This is not only the end focus of Holy Week. This is the end focus of the life of Christ. This is why he came. He came to lay down his life. He came to live a perfect life for 33 years on this earth and lay down that life. So when we take time here as a body of believers to remember what he did, uh, we follow what he did on that evening with the disciples. When he said, I'm going to take the bread and I'm going to break it, and I want you to know that this bread is my body broken for you. I want you to remember this because this is the focus. This is why I came. This is not only why I rode in on a donkey. This is why I came born of a virgin. Uh, this is the whole plan. This, this is what I came to do. I came to lay down my life. So he said, I, I want you to remember this. I want you to take the time, and I want you to think about this. So we, we use a little cracker here to represent the body of Christ that Jesus, uh, you know, broke when Jesus broke the bread that, that night. And then we have cups here also that are filled with juice that we use to represent the blood of Christ that was shed. The Bible talks about the life of the flesh is in the blood. So what we remember when we look at this, is we re or when we take this, is we remember that Jesus shed his blood for our sin. And at, at our church here, the invitation is open to anyone who believes in that truth. Anyone whose faith is in that, that truth, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, was given uh, for me. That he came, lived a perfect life, laid down that life for me. And because it bore, he bore my sin. He took my sin. That's why he suffered and died. And, and that's what he came to do. He came to die. So uh, we're going to, in a minute here, the music is going to play. There's a song called Thank You for the Blood. Beautiful song. When you, if you get a moment and you're done praying or whatever, just sit and listen to the words of it. But uh, during the, while that song is playing, folks are going to get up and come here, and you can get a cup and a, and a wafer, or, or it's also back there in front of the sound booth. Uh, if that's easier for you, you can come from both sides. But uh, you can take those then back to your seat, and uh, we will observe the Lord's Supper together. But at our church here, it is open for those who believe. You don't have to be a member or anything like that. But what the Bible does say is it's open for those who believe. 
And it also says that, uh, hey, our worship, uh, remember, is w if we've got things against other people, if we've got problems, and there's some reason why you, you don't feel comfortable observing the Lord's Supper today, please feel very comfortable to, to skip it today. Okay? Now, don't feel comfortable to skip it again next time. In other words, make whatever it is that keeps you from doing it today, make, make that right. But, uh, but I do just want to say that this is an open invitation for those of you who'd like to take some time today and remember the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. Father, um, this picture is so powerful. Help me to still my voice, just still, still my voice. And may the... Uh, you gave on that evening to the disciples may they be what we hear now as we stop and remember you this day in jesus name amen
Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of Christ. Nothing stronger than the wonder-working power that, has, that gives us life through his death. For on that night when he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples, This bread is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Afterwards, the scripture says he took the cup also. He says to his disciples, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood shed for you. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Father, as I prayed at the beginning, I pray again that your spirit would teach us what it means to have life through your death. And, uh, you know, even as we take some time and we hear about the crucifixion this week and we think about it, maybe we read about it more. Lord, help us to, to remember the significance of it, I pray, in the powerful name of Jesus. And, Lord, when we gather to celebrate the resurrection, may we do so believing in a hope that is beyond this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, now I said, uh, you know, I was talking about the, you know, some churches use a little shock and awe a little bit. Uh, we, Francis and I were visiting a church such as that, and they walked, when we walked in, their opening song of their service was, celebrate good times, come on. Yeah, uh, y'all know that song? Join us up. Okay, uh, we, will, we will not be starting with, cer- with that with church next week. I promise, promise you that. However, I do want that to be your mindset. Hey, we're going to celebrate, okay? Jesus, <laughs> death, death has no power, okay? And we gotta, we've got to talk about it, and we've got to celebrate, and we've got to understand just how incredible it is that Jesus gave, brought victory that he defeated sin and death. You going to be ready to celebrate next week? Okay, we're not, oh yeah, we're not, we're not going to start with that song, but you better start ready to, think I, no, never mind. Uh, no, we can't, can't do it. It's just, it's just too much. Maybe the moped, but not that. Uh, I don't think we can do that. If you stand with me, encourage you this week. Hopefully you're spending a little extra time and continue that prayer that God help us to understand even better what was accomplished at Calvary. Help us to understand what that means in my daily walk, I pray. In Jesus' name, we'll keep praying that and asking that as we go through the week. Amen. You may go.